Designing heat exchanger problems are basically just a bunch of heat transfer concepts stuck together. So for example, you have conduction. In the heat exchanger, you also have convection because usually you have a fluid product that's moving through the heat exchanger that's transferring heat from one place to another. So you have different modes of heat transfer. You have to figure out the rate of heat transfer. You usually have some kind of overall heat transfer coefficient to stick the different modes of heat transfer together. You have an area term over which you are conducting heat. And then you also have something called the log mean temperature difference. Previously, we've been using just a plain delta T to calculate the rate of heat transfer. But in a heat exchanger, you have multiple temperatures, not just two. So you have to figure out, how do I put all those temperatures together to accurately calculate my rate of heat transfer? Let's take a look at a design of heat exchanger problem to see how we put all of these particular heat transfer concepts together and figure out how large does this heat exchanger need to be. Here's an example design of heat exchangers problem. Here we have a heat exchanger. We're using a hot food to heat up a cold food, and at the same time we are cooling down that hot food. We'll call them products A and B. We have temperature data on those projects as they enter and leave the heat exchanger. We also have some information about our overall heat transfer coefficient and the amount of heat that is transferred in kilowatts. What we want to find out is the area required for heat transfer. And we want to find out if the heat exchanger is set up in countercurrent versus co-current mode. Those will be different. We're also told that the product temperatures don't change with the direction of flow, which is nice because now we're only working with one set of information. When we're doing design of heat exchanger problems, drawing the diagram is once again critical this time it helps you keep track of your temperatures. So let's draw the diagrams in both countercurrent and co-current mode. Here, co-current means that both streams are running in the same direction. Countercurrent is just what it sounds like. They're running in the opposite direction. Here's what the diagrams look like. All right, there's our diagrams. The left diagram is co-current, the right diagram, countercurrent. And you can see that not only do we have streams going in opposite directions for countercurrent, but look at where the temperatures are. TAI and TBO are on the same side, where TAO and TBI are on the same side. But in co-current, our in and our out temperatures are on the same side. So this is why we draw the diagram, to keep track of where our temperatures are, because it makes a difference when we go to write our log mean temperature equation. Before we get to the equations, let's just label the sides of the heat exchangers really quick so we are on the same page when we come back to calculate our log mean temperature difference. All right, I've labeled the left side of the heat exchangers as 1 and the right side as 2. It actually doesn't matter which side you label as side one and side two, as long as you are consistent. So remember that. We'll start with writing the equation for rate of heat transfer. All right, this looks very familiar. The only thing that's different is the LM on the delta T, and that stands for log mean temperature difference. What that equation looks like is this. Okay, there's our log mean temperature difference equation. So you can see now why we had to label the sides 1 and 2, because we have delta T2 versus delta T1. This does not mean delta T for product A and delta T for product B. It means delta T on side 2 versus delta T for side 1. So you're going to have a temperature from A and a temperature from B, in each of your delta T terms. And that's normal. That's what we want. The reason we're doing this log mean temperature difference is that if you think about putting thermocouples all the way along the length of this heat exchanger, they're all going to read a different temperature. But somehow we have to average them together so we have a representative temperature for our heat exchanger. 
if we did just a simple linear average, an arithmetic average, that wouldn't work right because our temperature changes are not linear to the heat exchanger. They're actually logarithmic, and that's why we use this natural log here to give us a log mean average. So log mean is the logarithmic average. That's where the LM comes from. So again, this is just to give us a representative delta T in our heat exchanger. All right, the next step is to calculate delta T2 and delta T1 for co-current versus counter-current. So let's take those. Okay, so now we've got delta T2 and delta T1 for co-current and counter-current. If you're thinking, well, wait a minute, if I take delta T2 minus delta T1 for co-current, won't that give me a negative delta T log mean? No, it won't, because you have a negative on the top. 5 minus 45 will give you a negative number, but you also have 5 over 45 on the bottom. And taking the log of a number that's smaller than 1 will give you a negative number. And so that's okay. We have a negative on the top, we have a negative on the bottom, they will cancel, we'll get a positive number. The magnitude of that number would be exactly the same as if we had delta T2 being 45 and delta T1 being 5. So no worries about that. Let's calculate that delta T log mean for both our co-current and our counter-current setups. Okay, we can see that for co-current, we have a smaller log mean temperature difference than for counter-current. And if we want to transfer the same amount of heat, we're going to need different area for each one. So let's work out what that area is. Okay, notice that I switched kilowatts to watts. That has to work because U has watts in it. It's 1100 watts per meter squared Kelvin. So I need to make sure to transfer kilowatts to watts so my units will cancel properly. If I plug in the delta T log mean for co-current, here's my area. On the other hand, if I do counter, here's what I get. All right, you can see that I need a quite a bit more area for co-current versus countercurrent. And this makes sense because the delta T log mean for countercurrent was larger than the one for co-current. So I need less area to accomplish the same amount of heat transfer in countercurrent mode. Given this, it probably doesn't surprise you that the vast majority of heat exchangers in industry are set up in countercurrent mode. That efficiency of heat transfer really adds up over time. So if you're running for weeks, months, years, however long, it's going to save you quite a bit in energy. So by setting your heat exchanger up in countercurrent mode, that truly is more efficient because you have a higher log mean temperature difference. You are getting your heat transfer accomplished more quickly. This is just one of the uses of design of heat exchangers. We figured out how large our heat exchanger needed to be, but we can also figure out what temperatures do we need on the hot and cold side to get a certain amount of heat transfer accomplished if we have a certain area. We can also figure out, well, what should the overall heat transfer coefficient of our system be? That can tell you things like, when is it time to clean the heat exchanger because our overall heat transfer coefficient has dropped too low due to defouling or some other kind of issue that blocks heat transfer. So you can figure out a maintenance schedule from your heat exchanger design equation. There's tons of applications for this. Just remember that it does matter if you set up in co-current versus counter-current mode and you do need to bring together many different heat transfer principles to be able to solve the particular design question.